Then, The first Friday lecture series is designed for alumni and friends of the college who are interested in hearing learned perspectives on a variety of topics from members of the St. John Fisher College and Greater Rochester community. This lecture season will be virtual as we cannot be on campus, so expect um, the remainder of the lectures to be in this virtual format. As a reminder, the chat feature is available for questions during the lecture. You can find that at the bottom of your screen with a text bubble icon. If you click the icon, a text box will appear and you can write your questions in the box. We will address all questions in the chat at the end of the lecture. I am honored today to introduce you to Dr. Eileen Merges to speak about the psychology of happiness, something I'm sure we can all get behind right now. Uh, Eileen is an associate professor of psychology here at Fisher. She offers students courses in psychopathology, human sexuality, child psychopathology, counseling, and the psychology of happiness. In addition, Dr. Merges conducts pedagogical research exploring different aspects of online courses and has collaborated with colleagues exploring the role of stigma in how people with post-traumatic stress disorder are viewed by others. Dr. Merges is a clinical psychologist who until very recently had a very active clinical practice in addition to her academic position. Dr. Merges is also an avid volunteer with Habitat for Humanity and has traveled all over the world working to provide safe housing and schools to those in need. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Merges. Hi, thank you for that very warm welcome. I appreciate it. And welcome all you Cardinals out there. I am hoping, I think some of you um, I might have had while you were here at Fisher as I've been here now, I think it's 17 years. <laughs> I'm guessing some, some of the alum I've had in classes are there as well as other people that I have yet to meet. So welcome, I'm really glad you're here. Um, and I am excited to kind of share with you today um, some thoughts about happiness. Um, we are certainly living in very trying times. Um, and I think it's an opportune moment for us to kind of reflect and um, get back in touch with the things that we can do to help promote our own happiness and well being. And of course, for your families and loved ones and friends. This is, is really helpful information you can share with all kinds of people. So um, I am looking forward to sharing with you the little bit that I know um, about this topic that I love so much. So I wanted to start first by just discussing a little bit about um, the field of psychology and clinical psychology in uh, specifically. So historically, we've already always studied what it is that makes people um, struggle, right? What are the obstacles that people encounter? What do they need help with? What can we um, do to help them function better when they're already experiencing some significant difficulty? So we kind of focused on the negative side of things more so than the positive. And it's just recently um, been more of a focus to look at how to help people who are generally doing okay function even better, or to help people prevent any of those really negative things from happening. Um, so this whole field of positive psychology is a, is a relatively newer one in the field, so, um, or in the, the bigger field of psychology. So probably just the last 15 years, 20 years, um, where people have really started to study um, this aspect of our functioning that it's kind of funny to think about, like we didn't really embrace it too much before now. Um, so I, uh, it's, it's great fun actually to really explore this stuff and it's super helpful as a clinician uh, in working with people to be able to share some of this information with people who are struggling, like, you know, they're beyond just let's help you not struggle. What can we do to help you really live a life that feels good to you? Um, so I, it's really been a great journey of exploration for me. So hopefully you will enjoy it as well. So this first slide here is one of the most optimistic things I'm going to share with you um, about happiness. And the research that's been done has been very clear that we actually have a lot of control 
over our own level of happiness. Um, so if you look at this pie chart here, what you see is that our genes do account for a significant chunk. So about 50% of our like set point or base rate happiness is predetermined by our genes. So you, you probably know if you have kids, you know kids, um, some kids just kind of come into the world really joyful and others come into the world a little bit more hesitant, right? Um, and that is our kind of genetic set point. That's only 50% though. There's a whole lot of other stuff that, that matters. Um, if you look closely, this 10% little pie there, 10% is our environment. That's the, the things in our world that we're exposed to regularly, right? So that's things like a pandemic happening. That's only 10% of it, of, of that sort of thing impacts our level of happiness. And the rest, 40%, is intentional activities that we can participate in or we can undertake. So we have pretty significant amount of control over the level of happiness that we experience. It's not, you know, it can often feel like we're just stuck, right? Like we are stuck in a terrible situation. And it really has been an extremely difficult situation. And many of us are literally stuck. But even within that, there are some things that we can do that will help us start to function better, to feel better, to kind of just shift our perspective. Um, and, and I think personally, this is like one of the most optimistic things about our level of happiness that we really have that much control. Um, these data are from a happiness researcher whose name I don't really know how to say, it's Liam Bomorski, I think, but she has written some great books and, and has done some really interesting research on these levels of happiness. Um, so there's that little bit of optimism for you. Um, the other thing, and my students, my college students love this <laughs> because, you know, uh, especially now as they're getting ready to graduate into a, a world where our economy is struggling and jobs are uncertain for them. They're very anxious. Um, and the research on this particular aspect of life is, is also pretty optimistic, I think. Uh, when Because we often think that if we have more money, we'll be more happy, right? That, that if we're wealthy, you know, wealthy people must be really happy. If you win the lottery, like it's going to be the best thing ever. Actually, it's really interesting because a lot of people who win the lottery struggle quite a bit. But anyway, the data suggests that it is true. You have to have enough money, all right? So if you look at this, um, the, the uh, <laughs> I totally forgot, is it the Y or the X axis? The bottom axis, I'm sorry. Um, what you can see is income level. And in, when people are really struggling, when they're living in poverty, their levels of happiness are much lower. Um, that is absolutely true until you get to about $50,000. Basically, you need enough money to pay your bills and, and to be able to have shelter, to have food. But beyond that, more does not equate to more happiness. So it's not that you have to be wealthy in order to experience joy and happiness. You have to have enough, absolutely to pay your bills um, and to provide for your family. But beyond that, it doesn't add anything. Uh, and some people would argue it adds negative. So that I think is also an optimistic thing. And, it, and what I know in my, with my students in my classes, we talk about how maybe that can help you shape your career goals. Uh, maybe you don't need to make you know $200,000 a year. Maybe finding a job that you really love that pays less is gonna be more important in the long run. Um, so that's also, I think, another bit of happy news. Um, now, this is also kind of an interesting finding. We, we uh, talk about this thing called hedonic adaptation, and it's related to the, the money can't buy happiness point. Um, what we know about human nature is that we tend to adapt to change. We tend to adapt and kind of go back to a baseline level of functioning, both positive and negative. 
So when you get a new car or a new house, um, or when you get married or a new job, like it is like the most exciting thing ever. And you're like, I'm so happy. This is, I love my new car. I love my new house. Like life is great. And then, you know, after a couple of weeks, honestly, you kind of settle in like, yeah, this is nice. You know, whatever. I'm back to my usual baseline level of function. It is also the case that we do that with negative things. So if we have an illness or if we experience a loss, initially there's a great intensity in the emotion that we experience. And then we come back to like a baseline level of functioning. It's hard and we have moments of intense grief, but overall, we've adapted to that change. And that's what happens when we, we think about money. So what tends to occur is that people get more money, they get more stuff, and then they're like, yeah, I want more stuff. I need a second house. I need, you know, a third car. It doesn't, it's not like they reach a level and say, oh, this is perfect. And I am super happy. And I'm going to stay this way for always. Um, so hedonic adaptation can be a trap if we think we need more to be happy, but it's also kind of a helpful thing when we're struggling because we know, you know what, I feel as bad as I've ever felt in my life right now, but I'm going to be able to adapt to this and I'm going to go back to a level of functioning that feels okay. Um, so hopefully that will give you something to think about. Um, the other thing that comes up when we talk about happiness is, well, first of all, isn't it fascinating that in uh, this country, we talk often about the pursuit of happiness, that that is embedded. It's like baked in to who we are as Americans, you know, the pursuit of happiness. But we often don't really think about what does that mean? Um, what is happiness, you know? And again, when we do research on this, it seems as though small things can bring us happiness, like ice cream. I'm a big fan of Ben and Jerry's. And when I open a pint, I feel happy, right? But is that enough? I mean, I suppose I could eat ice cream all day, every day, and but eventually I would not enjoy it anymore, right? But that those small things that bring us those moments of joy, that happiness, isn't really enough to build our life upon. They're great and we need those moments. But really what we're talking about is wanting a life that has meaning. And there are many people that have meaningful lives that don't feel a lot of joy every day. If you think about someone who works um, with people in hospice care, so people at the end of their life, those individuals often report having incredible meaning in their life and they feel really good about their life, but day to day, they're not experiencing a lot of joy and happiness. They are pursuing meaning and that is bringing them a sense, we, well, we call it eudaimonia. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it's a, a sense of life is important and meaningful. And this is what I want. I often think about a friend of mine um, who I met volunteering in Nepal, actually. Her name is Angel, and she's a civil engineer, and she's from Hong Kong. And she is very successful as a civil engineer. She makes a lot of money. She has a good life in Hong Kong. She gave it all up because her life didn't have enough meaning. And she now volunteers for uh, Doctors Without Borders, and she goes around the world to places that in great need and develop or designs and and does the work the civil engineering work around hospitals um she lives you know in a tent on a cot she has limited access to you know showers and ice cream that's something she really misses when i when we meet places around the world now i always bring her soap because that's something that she has a hard time getting but she gave up all of the things that we would associate with happiness to pursue a life that gave her more meaning. Of course, she was in a position to do that. She didn't have kids and she, you know, she had some flexibility about where she went. Um, but, but that's just an example of how meaning is really what we're 
pursuing in life and that you can in fact have a very meaningful life that doesn't necessarily equate to a lot of happiness the way we think of happiness. Um, so what we're really pursuing is eudaimonia. I guess it doesn't sound as good as like in the pursuit of happiness, we don't really say in the pursuit of eudaimonia because people would be like, what is that? But that is that feeling of happiness and living a good life. So Angel, for example, she, she's, you know, she's struggling a lot. She's dirty. She's sleeping on a cot, all of those things, but she still has moments of great joy, especially when she gets access to something that she hasn't had in a while, like good soap. Um, alongside of that though, it's like she's sleeping on a cot, but she has so much meaning in her life that it feels okay. So meaning can impose a stability on our life that's super important. Um, and I know like many of you are parents and I bet you would say being a parent is one of the best things in my life. It's one of the best things I've ever done. But I am also betting you would say, there's not a lot of joy day to day in being a parent. You have moments of intense joy, no doubt. But it's so, it's hard work being a parent, especially now. I mean, many of you probably have your kids at home, you're working from home, they're doing school from home. It's really, really difficult. And you probably are having lots of moments of like, I can't cope with this. But the importance and the meaningfulness of being a parent is, is sustaining you. It's, it's giving you some stability. Like, otherwise you just quit, right? You'd be like, I'm out. This is miserable. You're not going to do that right? You're a parent, you love your kids, you want them to do well, so you hang in there. So that meaning that we have in our life is super important to help us through those difficult times. And I know with like my college students, it's school. Like school's great fun a lot of the time, but it's also a lot of work. Like when they're doing a 20 page paper, they're, they're not loving life in that moment, but the meaningfulness of pursuing that degree drives them through those moments. So meaning is a really important aspect of our overall functioning and happiness. Um, many of you probably have heard of the book that Viktor Frankl wrote, Man's Search for Meaning. It's a, it's a beautiful book. It's super short. You could read it in a day if you wanted. Um, but it's about Viktor Frankl's experience as a young man in a concentration camp. And um, he was in Poland. And he was a uh, psychologist before he um, was sent to this concentration camp. So he was very mindful and aware of all of the psychological aspects of that horrible experience. And what he came up with through this experience was this idea that if someone knows the why for their existence, they'll be able to bear almost any how. So that meaning helps us get through the really, really awful times. Um, and, and that I think I've been thinking a lot about that personally now during this time in our country when there's so much that's difficult. And I wake up in the morning and I have meaning in my life that pushes me and drives me and helps me get through the day to day difficultness, right? So it's a, it's a really important thing to consider that when we say we want to be happy, maybe what we really should be pursuing is a meaningful life and having some sense of purpose and meaning that drives our days. If we have that, happiness is likely to be a byproduct. Um, so the meaningful life will lead to happiness for most of us. Okay. Hopefully that was uh, helpful and interesting to you. What I want to talk about a little bit now is just how our emotions function. Um, and we, again, I'm going to pick on our society because we there's some things we could work on. One of the things that we need to work on in our society is our tolerance for things that are negative, right? We do not like to feel negative things. We don't like to be unhappy. We don't like to feel anxious. If we feel that way, we think, oh my gosh, there's a big problem. But it's important to understand and appreciate that all of our emotions serve a really important function. And the example I use with my students is, you know, when you have anxiety about a test, what does that help you do? It helps motivate you to study. 
emotion and motivate the same root, right? So it's a, emotions serve to motivate us. When you're depressed, when you're sad, it's often that sadness that drives you to reflecting on your life and, you know, what is it that's not working right now? What changes do I need to make? If we didn't feel those negative emotions, we probably wouldn't do much with ourselves. Um, so emotions serve a, a super important function as far as driving our behavior. Of course, negative emotion can become too much. We can have too much of it. It can, it can serve to sort of paralyze us and interfere with our motivation too when it gets to be too intense. But in, in smaller doses, we need it. It's helpful to us. Feeling sad is not a bad thing. Sometimes when we feel sad, it, it brings us to a place of reflection where then we can appreciate all the beautiful things in life even more. So right now, I'll just you know, share a little personal information. My husband's in the military and he lives in Idaho and I'm here in Rochester and I miss him a lot. I feel really sad about that. Like it's, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, ah, and the dogs are there and I'm here by myself. But I'm so grateful. I have something in my life that I miss and that I can feel sad about. So if I didn't let myself feel the sadness, I wouldn't appreciate like how, how lucky am I that I have something that I miss in my life. Um, so those negative emotions can lead to really positive um, changes and, and can lead to positive emotion. So negative emotions, we can kind of understand like that it's important for these reasons. But what purpose does positive emotions serve in our life? And, and <laughs> researchers had wondered that, like, why is it important other than it feels nice? Why is it important to feel joy? Um, or excitement. Like, what is the point of that? And what we've discovered through um, ongoing work is that positive emotions help fuel our psychological resiliency. That basically we, we store up the positive feelings that we experience when we have, you know, a positive emotional event. And it, and it, serves to feed our soul basically. And then when life gets difficult, it helps us bounce back a little bit more. So we'll pick on me again. My family's back in Idaho. I miss them. Um, but because I have a wealth of positive emotion to draw on in that time, that's difficult and sad, I'm able to like get up and be like, yeah, I'm excited to go to school and I'm excited to be on campus and see students again. And it feels okay because I have like this storehouse, this bank of positive. So it's important um, that we pursue these positive emotional experiences in an effort to build our resiliency up so that when negative things occur, we're able to cope better. Um, so when we talk about resilience, resilience is our ability to bounce back, essentially when something is difficult. There's some people talk about it as bouncing forward. So they're not going back to where they were, but they're bouncing ahead. Um, and maybe what's going on for people who are super able to do this, who are very resilient, is that they are expert users of what we call the undo effect that they rely, they, they reflect back and they rely on positive emotional experiences to help them undo the negative effect of whatever is difficult in their life. Um, so positive emotions serve a really important function and it's, it's essential that we pursue these positive emotional experiences as we go forward um, because it helps us then when something gets difficult just kind of makes sense, right? Um, so oh, I talked about that. When we have those um, positive experiences, it helps us find meaning in the face of adversity. One of the things that I'm, I have just appreciated so much in teaching, I teach a class called the Psychology of Happiness. And I have to be honest and tell you, like I cry 
literally am crying when I'm grading my students' work because they're often reflecting on their life and the meaning in it or the joy that they feel. And of course, during uh, COVID and pandemic shutdowns and all of that, they've had a lot to say um, in their reflections. And so many times what I'm reading is that while it's really difficult and while they're, you know, they hate that they're not on campus, if, you know, they had to pivot off or they're worried about people, all of that, what they are reflecting on that they're grateful for is time with their families. You know, they'll talk about how, I was away living on campus and I didn't get to spend time with my parents and my younger siblings. And now I have dinner with them every night and we stay at the table talking for hours. I mean, it's just beautiful that even though things are really difficult, they're able to experience something positive in it. Um, so it, it's such an honor, honestly, to teach this class and get to, to be part of those reflections that they have is really great. Um, anyway, okay, I digress. Um, all right, so oh, we talk about, I'm sorry, look and see what I was referring to there, but we, we talk about an upward spi spiral as well. So when you experience something positive, when you have a positive emotion, a positive experience, you're more open then to seeing other positive experiences around you. So if you're a kid, a student who's you know learning from home now, and you appreciate like, wow, this is great because I get to play Monopoly or whatever with my family every night, you're going to start being open to other experiences that are positive, maybe helping to cook dinner that you wouldn't have considered before. So we have an upward spiral and we broaden those positive experiences and build upon them. Um, so it's a super important aspect of happiness is, is to build on um, those moments that we have that are good. So during COVID um, and all that has gone on with that and everything else, people are really tapped out um, and their uh, ability to kind of get through the day-to-day -day grind is, is definitely challenged. And it, you know, we talk a lot about happiness and all this great stuff, but it's really hard right now. And this is a period of time where resilience is what we need to rely on. Um, resilience is going to help us get through this time um, and, you know, help buffer us from, from all the, the negative that could happen if we can't find our way through it. Um, it is, you know, it's a really difficult time and it's a difficult time uh, for everyone. It's a, very difficult for kids uh, who are not able to go to school, who aren't around their friends. So if you're parents, these are, there are some things you can do to help your kids through this as well. Um, and after I finish talking here, you can ask me questions and I can help uh, come up with ideas for you if that's important or, you know, if that's a, a concern you have. So one of the things I first want to say about resilience is, you know, when we talk about depression and, and happiness, people often think that happiness is the opposite of depression. And what seems to be really clear is that it's resilience that's the opposite of depression. That people who have resilience can move through the negative without it derailing them. And and then happiness becomes sort of a byproduct. So what we really should be striving for in life is, is resilience. And that is what helps us in these difficult moments. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so as I mentioned, ability uh, resilience is the ability to cope with adversity and push through challenges um, in the pursuit of opportunity. Uh, some people um, do exceptionally well in really difficult times. That, that's kind of different. I'm not talking about those people who seem to excel when life gets really difficult. Um, just the rest of us who, um, you, you probably know people in your life. Some people are really struggling a lot right now and others are doing okay. You know, it's not great. They're not having a great time, but they're getting through it okay. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. So that ability to cope and, and how resilience fosters well-being in us. 
and again links back to that upward spiral. Um, okay, so uh, I love Winnie the Pooh. It's always one of my favorites. And one of the things I want to talk about that actually helps build resilience is gratitude. And Piglet had this great quote um, or this great moment from one of the Winnie the Pooh stories where he noticed that even though he had a very small heart, it could hold a rather large amount of gratitude. And I know it sounds trite and like, oh, that's just so simplistic, but there's really compelling evidence that practicing gratitude contributes to resilience. It contributes to a sense of well-being and happiness. And in order to do that in a meaningful way, we have to actually stop and carve out time to reflect on those things that we're grateful for. Um, you can do this in a variety of ways. I know in my classes, students keep a gratitude journal. You don't want to even do it every day because remember we talked about hedonic adaptation. You would start to sort of adapt to that everyday gratitude thing, but it's important that you get in the practice of noticing the things you're grateful for and reflecting on it a couple times a week. And when you start doing that, what happens is your thinking opens up to all the, the other opportunities there for you to feel grateful. So you might have missed, you know, the person holding the door for you or the person at Wegmans that was super nice to you when you checked out. If you hadn't already been practicing kind of looking for things to be grateful for. And that's the point. If we, if we look for it, we start to notice everywhere things to feel gratitude for. Um, so practicing gratitude, again, I know it sounds small, but it's so huge. And I would encourage, encourage everyone to do it. Um, again, you can do it through journal. People meditate just on feeling grateful. So they take time, they carve time out for meditation and, and their focus is on what are the things in my life that I feel grateful for? The other thing you can do that's so nice is to write letters to people um, and let express your gratitude for their role in your life, whatever it might be. Uh, it feels good for you to do that, but it feels great for them too. Um, so practicing gratitude, is, it's a, I, I like to think of it as like a shortcut to happiness and resilience. Another thing we can do is cultivate optimism. This does not equal, optimism doesn't equal naivete. It's not like, oh, you know, they're whatever, is it Pollyanna or whoever is like always so optimistic, they're not realistic. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is choosing to see the world, to see your situation in the world in a more positive light. So we do have a choice in which truth dominates. So I can, I'll give you examples about me. I can wake up in the morning and think, God, I am a loser. I suck at this. I'm terrible at that. I can't do this right. I'm, you know, no good at teaching. Like I have those moments where I'm like, I am a terrible professor, but I choose not to, to go down that path. I choose to see that, well, that could be true, but maybe the opposite is true. Maybe I'm really good at this. And I'm going to choose to see myself as a, a really good teacher today. When I make that choice instead of the other one, it changes my whole day, right? And it changes all of my classes. I can walk into class feeling confident and like maybe I have something valuable to share with students. So I'm choosing my best possible self each day and it, and it just opens up like a, a wide world of positive then. If I decided to choose that I'm terrible at this job, my whole day and probably week would be colored by that choice that I make. So I know it sounds strange, but we really can choose the truth of ourselves. Uh, you know, another example that's very relevant for many people is, you know, you, you hear people joke about this, like you're having a fat day or a bad hair day. That's a choice you make. Like I'm choosing to decide, you know, that I'm fat today or that I, you know, my hair looks terrible today or whatever. You can choose a whole other way of thinking about it. 
right? Like, you know, I woke up and, and was happy. I had chocolate cake yesterday, whatever it might be without the judgment in a negative way about that experience. So cultivating optimism, also super helpful. Um, this is related to um, our thoughts, right? So Shakespeare was one of the, the ones that talked a lot about how we think about things. Uh, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So we have experiences and events that occur in our lives. And the way we think about those events or experiences is what matters, not necessarily what occurred. So, you know, my hysterically funny story could be someone else's sad story. It's, it all depends on how we think about it. This, I was <laughs> reintroduced to this book. I don't know if you can see it or if it's backwards, but it's called How to Hold a Cockroach. And it's about this boy. And it, it's just a great book about being mindful and, and meditative. But he, the, it, the first chapter is a cockroach on the breakfast table with him. And he freaks out. He's like, this is disgusting. There's a bug. And then through the the course of the book, he starts to be open. So, well, maybe cockroaches aren't like, why do I think they're so bad? Where did that come from? They're just bugs. And, you know, they have a shiny shell and they're kind of cute. And he shifts the way he thinks about that cockroach and all of these other life experiences. And it changes his emotional state. He's no longer disgusted and panicked that there's a cockroach. He's like, yeah, it's just a bug. No big deal, right? And it's kind of cute in some ways. I know you're all like, ooh, gross. But, but you see, you can choose how to think about that particular event. So in order to cultivate optimism, there is one, uh, there's a bunch of, of activities one can do, but there's one that I like to do, and I teach it to my students, um, called the ABCDE model of thought disputation and it helps increase our optimism. This is a useful activity for all kinds of everyday experiences. And um, I'll just share with you one an example from a time where I had to use this because I was overwhelmed. So I had agreed to um, teach new online courses. This was pre-COVID, uh, it was before everything got derailed, but, and I had to develop these online courses. And it, <laughs> if you if you've not done this before, it's a lot of work to develop an online course. Online classes are a lot of work for faculty and students both. But anyway, I was a little freaked out. Like I'm never gonna. This, this is gonna be a nightmare. I can't do it. So the adversity for me, the A in A B C D E, was developing. I think it was two new online courses one semester. My belief about that was like, I am never gonna be ready in time and I am an idiot for taking this on. I should have said no, I'm stupid. I'm never gonna get this done. Which then the consequence of that belief is panic, like complete panic. And when I personally get panicked like that and overwhelmed, I just shut down um, and I don't do anything. I'm like, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I, retreat from that panic. Um, so it becomes overwhelming, shut down, that's the consequence. The disputation, so this is the work part of this. First, you have to identify the A, the B, and the C, but then the, the work part, the disputation is coming up with a different way of thinking about this situation. So for me, it was, you know what, I have managed such things before, and I don't have to have this 100% done perfectly the first day classes start. I have to have enough done, right? But I can continue to work on it and develop it. It doesn't have to be perfect. I've done this before. I can do this again. And, and that disputation then leads to the E, the energization, where I had a clearer head. I could tackle a project. I did one part at a time rather than the whole thing. And, and it helped me get through that negative experience. So practicing shifting the way we think when we have a negative event all by itself can lead to greater levels of happiness and well-being. Instead of getting swallowed up by the panic, you can 
go through these steps and practice shifting your thinking. I know it's hard. And, and sometimes when people are like clinically depressed, it's really hard to do this because their thoughts get so locked in in a negative way. But I promise you, if you practice this, it gets easier and you get better at it. Um, it's one of those things that it pays off in the long run. If you do the hard work of practicing it and I like write it all down, like start that way until it becomes more automatic and you're able to do it more with greater ease when things come up. So that's the ABCDEs of um, trying to, to shift our thinking so we can become a little bit more optimistic. Um, so I realized we have, there's 15 minutes left and I wanted to leave time for questions. Um, if there are questions out there or if I should just keep going. Um, there's a specific question here. Let's see. What do you guys think? I think you can keep going a little bit because we okay. have one question so far. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I yeah. left time. Okay. So other thing, other aspects of the way we think that impact our um, level of happiness and well-being is when we overthink, we ruminate. Um, and rumination is that thing we do when we just keep playing over and over and over again a negative events. So maybe you had an interaction with a person that didn't go very well, an argument or a whatever, if you keep thinking about it, you have to try and stop yourself from doing that because the more energy you give those negative kinds of things, the, the more negative you're going to feel. So asking yourself, does this really matter? And does my thinking about this change anything? Can, is, is there any good that's gonna come out of my rumination? You can also practice a stop technique, which is sort of just like, reminding yourself to cut it out. Sometimes people actually use like a little rubber band around their wrist and they'll like snap it when they find themselves ruminating on something that's just not very helpful. So trying to avoid overthinking is, is super important. And the other thing that um, there's quite a bit of work on is avoiding uh, comparison. And this is something that is really problematic um, now with, um, social media, right? And, you know, <laughs> Instagram influencers who are doing all this amazing stuff and people are constantly comparing themselves and their lives to what they see on these social media platforms and feel less joy about their own life. So it was Teddy Roosevelt was, I'm sure other people have said it, but who said, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. So you might be super happy. Oh, I just, had this conversation with someone um they got engaged they and it was a great they were so happy about that their ring wasn't as big as someone else's and as soon as they started paying attention to that they started to feel less excited about their engagement it was so sad to me like don't don't compare in that way you're you're missing out on your own joy when you do that it's really hard and this is something again that takes practice um, to not be constantly comparing oneself um, so that those are two other things we can work on. Um, and then I love this one, uh, practicing acts of kindness is a way to promote resilience and happiness. Uh, and I, it's this, it's a great thing that happens when we intentionally set out to be compassionate and kind with someone else, how much it helps us feel better too. So um, practicing compassion and trying to empathize and connect with other people and then do something kind for them is, is a great way to make that person feel good, but yourself too. Uh, it's important that we try to vary the acts and timing of these things so it doesn't become like a rote I'm always going to buy coffee for the person behind me kind of thing in the, the drive through um, because that's still a great thing to do for that person behind you, but it doesn't uh, contribute to your sense of well-being as significantly if you do it all the time. Like you want to try to mix it up a little bit. So 
surprise your neighbor and shovel their driveway or something. Um, whatever it might be, but varying the acts and the timing of those um, acts of kindness is important. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, oh, okay. I guess I'll, I think I'll probably stop after this one because I want to, I want to talk about this social relationships, um, and how important they are. And this is something that, uh, has definitely taken a big hit during this time of COVID. When I talk to college students now on campus, I ask, checking in, like, how are you guys doing? Like, what is it that you're struggling the most with? And it's always friendships and not seeing people. I can't even tell you how excited I am going to be to see my parents. I haven't seen them in a year now. I give them a big hug. Like, I cannot wait for that. So our social relationships, um, many, many of us are experiencing difficulty uh, not having the same kind of contact right now. Social relationships are super important. And what we know about them is there is less hedonic adaptation with social relationships. So we don't ever really get used to the benefit of that. It always feels great and novel and exciting when we have meaningful social interactions. Like as human beings, we crave that, we need it. We, we try to get it when we don't have it. I mean, and this is why it's important to, to understand and, and kind of have some patience for people who are struggling with like isolation and quarantine maybe during this time because we are just so driven to have these social contacts. It's, it's really hard for people. Um, so during this period of time, it's really incumbent upon us to try and figure out how to maintain social interaction that feels good. Um, I know I'm someone who likes to text. I love to text people, but I try really hard now to, to actually call people and do FaceTime and, and chat with them because I'm not getting it the same way other places. Um, so trying to make sure we, we are feeding the need we have for those social interactions during a time when we can't sit physically in the same room. So I would encourage you to actually have, you know, phone calls, FaceTime, you know, Zoom can be really tiring for some people. If you Zoom all day long, you probably don't want to Zoom with your family for dinner. But if you, if you have the energy for that, it's, it, I highly recommend it. I know with my family, we all Zoomed for Thanksgiving. We all hung out and ate together on Zoom. And it, it's strange at first, but it was so nice to have that connection. Um, so it's important to, to try to be as creative as you can. Go outside. You can sit outside and socially distance and see people. Um, it's super important. I know back in Idaho over the holidays, that's what people did. <laughs> you can drive, you'd be driving down, you know, into the national forest, and people are basically tailgating with these huge meals on the side of the road in a snowbank, um, connecting because we need that. Celebrating the good good times um, and the accomplishments that people have. The other piece of this that's really important is managing conflict. Um, so don't jeopardize um, a social relationship because there's conflict. You want to try to address it and work through it so you don't lose that connection. It's always so sad to me when people cut their family off. And, you know, I've worked with clients who haven't talked to their parents in 15 years or something like that's that's just a significant loss. And it's so important to spend the energy working through those things because these are relationships that we need so much. Um, and the other person needs them too. So um, focus, invest in your, in your social relationships. It's, it'll, it'll pay off for you for sure. And the other person. Um, okay, so we have like five minutes left. Um, do we have questions? We do. We okay. have probably four. Okay. Um, well, let's start with the one that was in the chat. It's a little bit about the reflection paper idea. Okay. And the question was, has it precipitated referrals re 
um, talking about the reflection paper with your students to student counseling centers um, or behavioral concerns teams. Uh, they have toyed with the idea of doing the same, but um, is it too, does it create a vulnerability risk? Um, um, it sounds like the reward might outweigh the risk. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, but I would argue that um, it is worth it, be, in part because students are experiencing whatever they're experiencing at, anyway, whether I know about it or not. So if in a reflection, um, they are revealing a struggle that is bigger than I, I feel comfortable with, then absolutely, they, I refer them to the counseling center. But they're having that experience, whether I know about it or not. So at least if, if they're reflecting on it and sharing it, I have an opportunity to connect them with someone that can be helpful. The other thing that I find is that very often uh, students are able to shift the, a negative experience into something more positive when they start actively reflecting on it. So the, the payoff I think is, is worth it. And again, you know, these are kids that are going to be struggling, whether I know about it or not. And I think I'd probably rather know and try to connect them with somebody. I don't think the simple act of having them reflect creates a concerning situation. It just lets me know about it. Um, and then, you know, I will work to connect them with what I can. Does that answer the question? Great. Yes, it did. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, the next one. I'm wondering if you have any advice on to how to help motivate others who are having a hard time finding gratitude or something to look forward to without being preachy. <laughs> yeah, it, that's an important one. And I have run into that um, certainly often. I, I often will start with uh, strongly urging someone just to go for a walk outside um, because that is a really beautiful way to shift the way you're thinking just by being outside. And, and oftentimes what happens is people notice something pretty, something beautiful to look at, a bird, a tree, whatever. And, and when they get back from their walk, you can ask them like, hey, did you, you know, did you have a good walk? Did you see anything interesting? And then they can maybe share that with you. And then you can help them expand upon like, wow, that's really cool. I'm really grateful you shared that with me. And, and it, can be the starting, the launching off point for um, opening up to more, to being more grateful. The other thing is that, you know, I have, I can share um, some books, uh, some titles with you all that are, have been helpful with, for me in sharing with people who are reluctant. I, there's a great book I, I have my students read called The Antidote, which is, um, the, I think it's, I can't remember the whole title, but, but basically it's like the guide to, to happiness for people who hate positive thinking. Um, so it's, it's sort of a different approach to getting there, but, and I can share those titles with you, but a walk outside or just sitting outside can often be enough of a shift and, and help people start opening up to more things. When we stay in our little inside bubble, it's very hard um, to bust out of that. So I recommend walks outside for sure. Okay, next question. What was the name and the author of the first book that you referenced? Uh, the How of Happiness, that book by Sonia Liam Bomorski is her name or the How to Hold a Cockroach book. <laughs> <laughs> this one is Matthew Maxwell. I will, I'll share all the books um, and we can, can we send them out to people? Yes, okay. so after the lecture, I will send out um, the recorded version of the lecture because some people had trouble and we can include that on there. Okay, great. Yeah, there's some great books out there for sure. So. All right. How do you balance choosing to see your best self and telling yourself you're doing a good job while also striving for honest self-reflection and possibly receiving constructive criticism on ways that you can improve? The negative input always seems to dominate thoughts. That is such a great question. Um, and, and your best possible self has to be rooted in reality, right? We don't want to uh, falsely build up ourselves. And then like, like I could decide I'm the best professor in the world and walk in a classroom and crash hard and then really have a problem. 
So that's a really excellent question. And I, I think, you know, we, this is a longer sort of um, activity, but we have to engage as scientists in exploring our thoughts. So what is the evidence out there that I'm a, a good professor versus a bad professor? You know, and I can say, well, I've had good evaluations. I won teaching awards. Students tell me, you know, they enjoy my classes versus, yeah, sometimes I fall flat in a lecture, whatever. But I can look at all the evidence and then decide to choose that day to go with this evidence over here rather than this negative evidence. The other thing that is often really helpful is just having people reflect on, is this a useful way for me to think? Whether it's true or not, is it useful? You know, maybe I've gained 50 pounds and I don't feel so healthy. I, it's, it's important to know that and maybe I need to do something to be healthier, but is it useful to beat myself up and call myself fat all the time? Is that useful? No, probably not. What's more useful is saying, I, I want to focus on being healthier now. So sometimes just shifting the words we ask of ourselves, like, is this useful? Is this helping me in any way to think this way? Is there a different way I can think that would be more useful and more helpful? Um, and I, you know, and again, trying to, to be empirical in how we evaluate ourselves and gather evidence, but also just, is it useful? Because there are different interpretations, different ways of thinking about the same thing. What's the most useful way to think about it? Does that help? Great. I have two more questions. Okay. Oh, hi, Chris. <laughs> Sorry. Thought on this statement. A parent is only as happy as his or her least happy child. Yeah, I hear that often. And, and I think for parents, it's really difficult to separate their own happiness from their child's happiness. Um, and I would just encourage parents to think about how, um, this might sound harsh, I don't mean it to, but you're, you're connecting your happiness with your child's doesn't help the child any either. And many times kids know that and they feel added pressure to get it together because mom and dad are unhappy too because I'm unhappy. So you obviously you want your ch child to be happy and you want the best for them, but you don't want it to become so enmeshed that you can't have separate emotional experiences. Um, and, you know, kids are amazingly resilient. They're, they're often more resilient than adults and they might be going through a terrible struggle, but there's a lot of optimism and hope that that's gonna be short term. Um, but I think just kind of trying to remind yourself that my imposing my emotions on, on this child is not gonna help them do any better. Um, and I need to model for them happy, resilient person so that maybe they can start learning some of that as well. It, that can also be a helpful way to think about it. But that's a great question. It really is. And it's not, there's not an easy answer to that. Just maybe some different things to think about. Okay, this is the final question. And I think probably most of us um, in the Rochester area can relate to it. I suffer from seasonal depression. It's cold, cloudy, and not much sunshine. Winter here lasts too long. No kidding. Yeah. Um, what are some ways of su or suggestions on how to overcome other than taking a vacation to the Caribbean? <laughs> well, vacation's always helpful. Um, the other thing I'm just going to check with your doctor, but vitamin D supplements, super helpful. Most Rochesterians are vitamin D deficient. It's like 80% because <laughs> we don't get enough sunshine. Um, but you know, I think I've, I've always appreciated sort of borrowing from Scandinavian countries because they're also, you know, in the dark a lot and it's gray and cloudy. And they, they talk a lot about like burrowing in and all the comforts like fireplace and a blanket and a book and a hot chocolate and a tea and, and really trying to embrace the cozy comforts that in the summertime we don't. Um, and, and thinking of it as a time where we can shift from, 
you know, being outside and enjoying the sun all the time to like these cozy little things that we don't do other times of the year that I know always helps me when I'm feeling miserable about the gray cold. It's just, oh, well, yeah, I get to be cozy now. Put my fluffy socks on and my PJs and sit with a blanket. <laughs> Wouldn't do that in the summer, right? So, it, but definitely uh, think about pursuing vitamin D. It's, it's a big help. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for all your questions. Thank you again to Dr. Murgis for joining us today. As a reminder, we have recorded this lecture. So if you had a little trouble getting on, we will be sending an email out as soon as it becomes available. Um, we will include the books that Dr. Murgis spoke about as well. If you have additional questions, you can reach out to the alumni at sjfc.edu inbox, and we will funnel them directly to Dr. Murgis. Our next lecture will be on Friday, March 5th on building a trauma-informed school with Dr. Susie Hildebrandt and Dr. Mike Wisnowski from the Education Division at Fisher. Um, thank you all again for continuing to support the lecture series and we will see you again in March. Thank you, bye.